All right, welcome everyone. Despite what the uh, WebEx might say, I'm Carrie Hopkins Isles, and I'm the Deputy Director of ICU DDR. And we're so glad to see so many of you here today. I'm glad that you found out about this webinar and were able to join us. And I know you have a lot of competing um, <laughs> business and, pe and people who are asking you to be on Zoom and all other types of online. So we're hoping to really make the most out of this hour we have together and give you great value. Um, I just want to encourage you to go to our website, icudr.org. We are making it much more dynamic these days where if you go onto the homepage, you'll see sliders that change and show you webinars that are coming up and um, opportunities for courses. We have our call for proposals that just went out today for our conference, which will be in July. So we're hoping that you will um, frequently go to the website. We're gonna be starting to have a lot more content there. So I want to introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Satterfield, who is Academy Endowed Chair for Innovation and in Teaching, Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and who um, we actually sought out because we saw a presentation of this, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but of this type um, that was so excellent and Kim asked if he would be willing to join us, and so we're so glad to have him here today to talk about how to make your teaching matter, which I know we all care about deeply, evidence-based teaching strategies for addiction professionals. So with that, I will give it over to you, and thank you. Perfect, thank you. And I, I want to uh, extend a warm welcome to everyone joining us today and to anyone that may be joining us later uh, asynchronously. And I also want to express gratitude for all of the teachers and trainers and supervisors out there who are committing uh, to do what they can to make their teaching more effective because we know it's not easy, especially these days. And the more that we can learn about what works or what doesn't work, I think the more effective we can become in helping our learners to grow and become better uh, health professionals. Jason, I just want to try to put, do this poll real quick. I don't know oh, if sure. it'll let me. Um, I, I didn't. I forgot that I wanted to try and do it, but I don't know if it'll let me do it or if I have to do it. Because um, I created the poll, but you might have to open it for me if you're willing to do that. Um, but I you know, there should be a poll that you can open. And I'm trying to mute everyone as we go, but if you can mute on your own end, that would be great. Okay, here we go. Yeah, can you start that poll? Is it starting in an option? I think folks are voting already. Yay. Yeah, it helps us out a lot to know where you learned about the poll or where you learned about the webinar so we can make sure to get this information out in the best possible way. Um, some of our webinars are really well attended and some of them are not. So, <laughs> um, and as I said, I know everyone's also getting a little bit, um, a little bit of online emotional exhaustion of, of learning even when you know it's a great topic. So uh, I'll give it another few seconds there, thank you. Sure, and I see that's poll three. Do you have two other questions, it's poll one? No, two. I just didn't know how to do it, so I tried it three times, <laughs> okay. and, and the third time was a charm, <laughs> but thank you. Okay. That so whole thing like we were talking about earlier with learning all the different platforms, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> so it looks like website and newsletter are the top two, but colleague is close behind. All right, thank you. Great. So I'll, I will go ahead and uh, close the poll then. Thank you so much for letting us know how you learned uh, about this. And let's go ahead and let's uh, jump in. So 
So first is uh, I want to share that I have no uh, conflicts of interest or commercial disclosures. Um, I do direct or have a key role in a number of different uh, state and federal projects, most of them related to substance use disorders uh, and uh, mental health in primary care settings. Um, a little, just a little bit about my background so you know the lens uh, through which I, I view this material. I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I have been embedded in an adult primary care clinic at an academic health center for about the past uh, 25 years or so. I teach medical students, residents, uh, nurses, pharmacy students, dentists, and uh, psychology fellows as well. So a lot of interprofessional opportunities there. I always like to start with learning objectives because it gives uh, uh, teachers as well as uh, learners an idea of what it is that we hope they will get out of a particular session. So here are the four things that we're going to do and the four things that I hope you will uh, walk away with today. So first we'll go over some of the basic learning, uh, basic principles uh, of learning derived from educational theory and educational research. And throughout we'll talk about, or we'll use this term called evidence-based teaching. Um, we mean evidence-based teaching in the sense of what do we know works in terms of educational research that's been done. I always remind my, my colleagues that just that folks get you know, a doctoral degree in medicine or psychology or maybe nursing or social work or wherever, there are plenty of folks that get doctoral degrees in education because there is a science to it and there is a methodology that helps us to better understand what works or maybe what, what doesn't work. I do want to say, though, that even though we're going to be talking about minds, we're going to be talking about data, we're also going to be talking about the heart because I think true transformative learning happens where the mind meets the heart. So we'll be talking about stories and talking about data and how to blend those two. The second, we'll be talking about a structured uh, process for developing a curriculum, and we define curriculum broadly. It can be a course over a semester, like in a, a, a training program, or it can be a workshop, or it can just be a one-time teaching session only. We'll think about the stages of how you go about designing and creating it and hopefully optimizing outcomes. We'll talk about different instructional techniques. So is it best to use PowerPoint slides? Is it best to use small group discussions? Can you do something called a flipped classroom? Is it okay to be online? And if you're online, how can you uh, promote some uh, meaningful engagement from your learners when there's so many distractions around? And lastly, we'll talk about some evidence-based assessment tools. So you need an idea of whether or not your session was effective. Has it changed minds? Has it changed hearts? Has it changed behaviors and practices? And we'll talk about a framework uh, on how to do that. So our roadmap, we'll do our principles. We'll talk about this model for uh, stages and processes of curriculum development. We will include a bit on instructional techniques. There's lots of choices to make, and uh, this is where you can get really uh, creative and have a lot of fun with this. Talk about assessments and evaluation, and, and then I'll leave you with some resources for educators. Um, I, I know that uh, there's a wide range of different sort of teaching backgrounds and teaching resources that people come with. Uh, sometimes we don't have any resources and very little time. So it helps to know where you can go, really these uh, digital repositories or libraries, uh, where you can find already developed resources and you can piece together uh, your, your course from that material rather than reinventing the wheel. So just a, a quick caveat, I, I think there's all sorts of learners on all sorts of, of levels, and I hope that throughout our lives that, that we're able to see ourselves as learners and as teachers at the same time. Um, but uh, what we'll be talking about today are edu educational programs for health professionals and not so much uh, patient or client education or education for families. There's certainly some similarities, but I, I think it, it's different. Um, most of us wouldn't sit down with a client and give them the objectives for the education session that we want to do with them to help them better understand their disease or, or how, how to help uh, a loved one. So we'll be focusing on the uh, professionals. Okay, let's do a little bit of priming. And, and I, I think, you know, as we go along, I will um, uh, think out loud and, and let you know sort of why we're doing some of the things that we're doing. It's always challenging in a, a PowerPoint where you can't see other people or maybe people are watching this asynchronously. So it limits the amount of, of interaction and engagement. But I want people to, to sort of move their headspace to think about what it is that we're doing. I want to sort of activate, uh, trigger, if you will, those kinds of memories of your own personal experiences. They call that process anchoring. So we want to anchor the content and your personal experience. That way it's easier to remember and it's also easier uh, to relate to. 
So I, I want to, uh, you to think of all of the different contexts where you formally or informally teach. So is it a class, a, a seminar, is it a webinar? Um, are you leading discussions during, say, a staff meeting? Are you providing clinical supervision? Are you providing managerial supervision to people who are on your team? Maybe providing, you know, continuing education. Um, do you work with interns on your team or, you know, little SIBs or, or sometimes they're called near peer uh, collaborators um, where you are modeling or maybe observing them uh, delivering treatment uh, to, to a client? So when you think of your role in those different settings, what do you think you currently do well and what are the, some of the things you would like to improve? And another way to think about it is what are some of the challenges could be time, could be resources, it, it could be just the amount of workload that you have in addition to teaching, but also what are some of the facilitators? And, and I think as we go along, it's so important not just to think about challenges or weaknesses or negatives. We also want to take a strengths-based approach where we think about what is it that you do well? What is it that you have at your disposal? What are the success stories that you want to carry forward just as we so naturally, I, I think, carry forward the, the challenges or the failures? So what is, is educational science or, or learning science? And we don't need to uh, go to graduate school uh, in education uh, to know that there is a, a vast and important field uh, if educational research aimed at advancing knowledge of education, learning processes, processes, and the development of tools and methods. In essence, it helps us to better understand what are the best strategies to accomplish our goals now, as you can imagine, there's no one size fits all. Uh, it's a, first about thinking about what is it I'm trying to change? What is it I want my learners to do? Is it their attitudes? Is it their knowledge? Is it their skills? Is it all of the above? Am I trying to transform a, a culture or a work climate? So first thinking about those goals, then thinking about the uh, whether or not there are proven strategies to help you achieve those goals. And that's why we're going to go through this sort of stepwise process of curriculum development, because it, it really helps and I think is really essential to first think about what is it I'm trying to achieve? And it can be formal teaching, informal teaching, curbside consults, 15-minute teaching sessions, or uh, an entire course or maybe even an entire training program. So evidence-based teaching uh, is, is just like, uh, you know, you've heard the terms probably evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine, where we are trying to look at what the research tells us in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Now, oftentimes there isn't research or maybe we can't find an evidence-based practice, and that might be true for evidence-based teaching too. But first we want to look and see what lessons have we learned? What strategies do we know work in what particular context? This will help us to make informed choices and to use our limited resources more wisely. There's no 100% guarantee, and I think part of being a good educator is being flexible and being nimble. And when you see that something's not working, being able to pivot and to try something different. It might be about the curriculum, but it might also be about your learners, or it might be about the, a change in the context of how you had to deliver the material. Uh, a good example of this and something that you may have experienced is with the shelter in place for COVID. I uh, teach several medical student courses. Um, the day before our course on um, health and the individual started, where we talk about uh, psychopathology, we talk about substance use disorders, we talk about health disparities and health equity. The day before shelter in place uh, started uh, and we had to pivot literally overnight to turn that into an online course when it had been an in-person course. Uh, definitely was a sleepless night that night, but we were able to pivot and I think still create a quality learning experience for the students, even though it was different and honestly I think all of us would have preferred to be in person, but they were still able to learn uh, uh, online. So what are some of the core principles then of, of learning theory? And I, I think it's important that we remember that learners proceed through developmental stages. So part of what you want to do is to think about, uh, and, and in essence, uh, um, empathize with the cognitive, emotional, and motivational level of the learners that you happen to be working with. And I, I will say just from my own experience, uh, I've been seeing patients for about 25 years or so, and it's very easy for me to do, say, an intake of a new patient. I don't need to look at a chart. I don't need to look at a structured outline of the questions to ask. 
it's an internalized automatic skill set. So it takes a lot of work for me to step back and to remember this may be the first, second, or maybe fifth patient that this student is interviewing. They don't have that internalized skill set. So I need to slow down. I need to provide more structure. I need to remember that it's actually pretty scary the first few times that you're interacting with someone. A lot of insecurities get activated, lack of confidence, the desire to do good, knowing that you're being evaluated, really trying to empathize with where your learner is so that you can better adapt your strategies, your tone, and your pacing to understand understand them. I think when you have a lot of different teaching tools, again, this is where the flexibility comes in because you have to be able to jump from learner level to learner level. So I do teach uh, faculty, I teach uh, residents, I also teach first year medical students, and I teach pre-medical students that are hoping to get into med school someday. They're very, very different. They're along the same kind of trajectory, but they're going to be in different places. Some other core principles that I think are important to keep in mind, and depending on where you practice and sort of the culture of that environment, it's the first bullet point I want to emphasize, uh, data or talking about studies, um, that is important and we want to be evidence-based uh, when possible. Uh, but even though data is conducting its stories that people remember, and over the years as I've had students sort of graduate and move on and develop their own careers and they come back to me, I love asking them, what do you remember the most? about what we taught you. And it has never once been, oh, I remember this study, or I remember this data slide, or I remember this data point. It's, I remember the time when you brought a much esteemed physician to class and she disclosed her history of struggling with depression. She disclosed her history of having a substance use disorder. I could be her. In fact, sometimes I am her, and I will never, ever forget uh, the stories that she shared with us. So it's about data, but it's about stories, and I think both of those are important. That's the mind and the heart part that I was talking about. Next bullet point, and when you're, you're again, thinking about learning modalities, multimodal approaches tend to be the best. So that would be, sure, some PowerPoint and limited amounts are okay, but you also want discussions. It could be small groups, large groups, pair shares. Uh, integrating videos, having role plays where people actually have to produce the language that you're hoping that they will say and have uh, uh, an interaction with the peer or maybe multiple peers. We want exercises where they apply things in class and maybe also apply things outside of class. Now these different modes, I think, help to retain and sustain engagement of the individual because using one particular mode for an extended period of time, people start to tune out. It's also important to remember that some people learn better in different ways. So if you're using multiple modes, you're sort of hitting those different strategies that might work better for uh, particular learners. The last bullet is that multiple doses of teaching are often required before a learner can acquire a complex uh, skill set. Now, you may just have one teaching session, so there's not the option of multiple doses, but you do then have the option of emailing them later or of having an exercise in that teaching session where they write a note to themselves, which is then sent to them, them later. I have been at workshops where we set goals and objectives and timelines. We put it on a self-addressed postcard, hand it in to the facilitators who then later mail it. They don't have another session with us, but essentially I've gotten reminded of what I had committed to do because I get that postcard. Uh, in the mail. When we think about uh, teaching in the School of Nursing, uh, we call it a spiral curriculum where we will uh, introduce concepts in their first year, then we will spiral back to those same concepts in a much deeper and more elaborated way in their second year and in their third year or wherever they happen to be in their training program. So uh, what is adult learning? And I, I think it's important, and again, there's a range of, of different learners, uh, but most of the people that we will be teaching are adults. Uh, they may be young adults, but they are still adults. They may be at different levels of professional experience in working with clients or patients. So uh, the differences in working with youth uh, or adolescents versus adults, adults tend to be more problem-based and collaborative. They want to know, why does this matter? How do I apply it? And how do I work with other people? Uh, teacher and learner tend to be closer to the same level uh, of experience. You bring expertise that they may not have, but in terms of psychosocial, emotional, motivational development, you may be at a, a closer level. 
Uh, adults tend to be more internally motivated and self-directed. They also have more responsibilities and, and maybe less time that they can invest in learning, uh, but that's a different uh, sort of challenge than with younger learners. Adults prefer practical applications. Um, you might be interested in knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, but I think particularly in the health professions, uh, uh, when people come to a webinar, a seminar, or take a particular course, they're trying to hone or to improve uh, their skill set or maybe to solve a particular problem. Fortunately, adults also come with a lot more life experience and a better perspective, so you can do more of that anchoring. You can have them draw on their own stories so that it feels richer and more personal and more tailored to who they are. So let's talk about uh, curriculum uh, development, and I'm going to show you two different models, sort of a, a quick and dirty model and, and then uh, a more uh, elaborative, uh, elaborate uh, and, and I think interesting model that takes a little more, more time. Um, so this section is useful if you need to create a new training program or even just a single session. It's also useful if you want to revise or improve an existing curriculum, or maybe if you just want to understand how these kinds of things are pieced uh, together. The two models that we're going to be using, the first one is called GNOME, uh, G-N-O-M-E, and the other one is a uh, sort of more classic uh, six, and I expanded it to seven stage uh, curriculum model developed by David Kern, mostly in a medical school setting, but uh, we're using it in the School of Nursing and School of Social Work as well. Okay, so the first one up uh, is GNOME, um, and GNOME simply stands for uh, Goals, Needs, Objectives, Methods, and Evaluation. So it breaks this process down into uh, multiple steps. So the goal is what are you trying to uh, accomplish? What is the problem uh, that you're trying to solve? Um, your needs, uh, what do your learners or patients need? So that requires, I think, doing a, a little bit of exploration of better understanding where are my learners starting. That's partly developmental level, but it's also partly uh, getting a sense of what is it that is already known uh, and what is it that isn't known. I will say that um, over the years, and so I've been, been teaching for 25 years uh, or so, um, our learners, our first-year students, have arrived uh, with very different skill sets, and I, I find that really fascinating. So when we were in the 90s uh, teaching about uh, what is culture and what is cultural com competence, uh, and we were doing that then, um, um, our learners were arriving, and many of them were saying, well, I don't, I don't think I have a culture. Um, obviously something that, that's not true, and I think a belief that's not held so commonly now now we have learners that are arriving that are much more sophisticating and they're sophisticated in their understanding of sociology, psychology. It's a requirement now to get into uh, medical school. They've thought about health disparities, health equities. They've thought about social justice and activism. So they're starting at a much higher level, so their needs are different. The needs then became a challenge for some of our faculty who felt like the learners were arriving knowing more than the faculty. So we had to raise uh, uh, all boats by doing training for everybody. So the O part is the objectives, and here we want to specify what will be learned. And it can be course objectives, it can be session objectives, and I think the more concrete and specific you can get, the easier it is to do your assessments later, and the easier it is for your learners to know exactly what you want or expect from them. The methods, so this is where we talk about pedagogical techniques. So how will it be taught? Is it going to be a Zoom class? Is it going to be uh, field trips? Is it going to be uh, a, a book club that you'll be using? Lots and lots of different choices we'll get to later. And then the E evaluation is how will it be assessed? This is the, the Kern model. It's, it's uh, typically a six-step model, and um, I couldn't resist just adding on a seventh step because when you read through the Kern model, it gives you the sense of, okay, once you've been around this well, once you've been through those six stages, you're done. And I think most experienced teachers know that's not the case, or hopefully is not the case, that your curriculum is always growing, is always improving, is always changing based on the changing needs of your learners or the changing climate or uh, what's happening out in, in the world. So we have, just to give you an example, we've pivoted this year and when we're teaching about uh, prevention of infectious disease or we're teaching about medical ethics, we're bringing in a lot of COVID 
examples because it's so uh, present and it, it's so immediate and it's so important for our learners to be able to see why this, why this particular information matters. In the realm of substance use, we're doing a lot more around opioids and around uh, overdose uh, prevention and different sort of health systems changes that might help uh, patients, might prevent opioid uh, use disorders or might help those patients who have developed them receive treatment. So if we look at the steps of the model, you can see it, it's similar to GNOME. Here is problem identification and general needs assessment um, refers not just to the learners, but to the, the problem or the issue in society that you are trying to solve. So is it the prevention of overdose of, of opiates? Is it uh, uh, the prevention of transmission of HIV, for instance? So what's the problem? And in my context, I'm in a, a healthcare setting, so it's usually sort of a, a health need that we're thinking about. The targeted needs assessment is more about the learner, and you might even use a, a survey, an interview, or a focus group to get an idea of what folks need. Again, your goals and objectives. Goals are bigger and broader. Objectives are more specific. Your educational strategies. Um, this model, unlike GNOME, puts in an implementation step. And here you can sort of put your change management hat on and think about um, how am I going to get buy-in from my other faculty, from my other supervisors, from the leadership when I tell them I need an extra four hours to teach this information or I need a certain set uh, of resources or I need to advertise my course on your website, for instance. So all of those pieces are important if you're going to be able to promote uh, uptake of the educational intervention. Evaluation and feedback, that was also part of GNOME. And then I mentioned that seventh step of curriculum maintenance and enhancement. And, and I, I, I hope that feels um, exciting and inspirational and, and not discouraging that you're never quite done. Uh, but it means that there's always room to grow and to improve and to uh, be creative. So let, let's dive a, a little bit deeper in, in each of these, and then I, I'll sort of fast forward to some of the teaching strategies because I, I'm sure folks are interested in that as well as in uh, evaluation. So these bullets um, give you an idea of the kinds of questions you might ask as you are trying to identify the problem in a needs assessment. So what's the scope, frequency, and consequences of this problem? Maybe it's opioid use disorder. Uh, maybe it uh, is uh, uh, alcohol use disorder. Um, maybe it is uh, HIV or, or COVID prevention or addressing vaccine hesitancy. Um, of those people involved, uh, what do they currently know and what do they need to learn? The needs assessment, um, and we do usually a mix of, um, we often do quick online surveys, so we'll do like uh, Qualtrics surveys or SurveyMonkey or something like that, um, or we'll just uh, interview students. And we've, we've learned that whenever we're developing uh, new materials, it's so helpful to have stakeholders and participants as part of your development group. They know what their peers know, and they know what their peers need, so they can help you in terms of targeting the right level, and they can also help you in uh, selecting the right kinds of readings or assignments or even the, the preferred language to use. So here's your curricular goals. Uh, you can address knowledge, uh, skills. You can address beliefs or attitudes. You want to think about, you know, what's the goal of the course if you're doing this on a course level, or if it's uh, a single session, uh, what are the objectives for that particular session, and then how will you know uh, if you've been uh, successful. So I want to say just a word about uh, writing learning objectives because I think a lot of people don't know how to do this. So oftentimes you will see things like, know XYZ or list the diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder. And those are fine, uh, but really if you think about them, they're asking people to memorize lists of information, which isn't particularly interesting. Um, and we know that uh, those sorts of types of learning tend to fade rather quickly. So you want to be concrete and specific. You want them to be measurable, but you want to try to go up uh, on something that's called Bloom's taxonomy and a sort of an unwieldy term, but I, I think once you see what it, it means, it makes a lot of sense. So in Bloom's taxonomy, you just think of it as a pyramid. And the higher you go in the pyramid, the more engagement and processing it requires the learner to do. And given that we usually have limited time with our learners, we want this information to be as deeply embedded in their minds and their hearts as possible. So the lowest level uh, here at the bottom where it says remember is just 
simple recall. Memorize the Krebs cycle or, or memorize the three different types of SSRIs uh, that are most commonly used. Um, a step up above that is where you ask them to explain an idea or to explain a concept. Above that is to apply it, say, to a case or a case study. Analyzing it, so this is where you get things like compare and contrast these two different models uh, of uh, substance use uh, treatment. Evaluate, so they have to uh, look at a new plan. Um, for our students, we uh, have them to uh, debate and create a new municipal drug policy for the city and county of San Francisco. They have to develop the policy, present it, the class then debates the different policies on the table and they all vote on it. So they have to uh, evaluate and eventually actually make a decision. And then create is where they actually have to produce a new or uh, original work. So that might be uh, writing a report, uh, writing this drug policy plan, uh, or, or designing an intervention. So the goal, again, is to get as high as you can on Bloom's taxonomy. It can't always be up at the top, uh, but look at your objectives. And if there's too many on those bottom tiers, especially the remember ones, think about rewriting those. So uh, here's a, a couple of examples of learning objectives. So the first one lists the five stages of change specified in the trans theoretical model. So that's fine, and, and I think the model has been quite useful in helping us to understand the process of change and how it's not all or none. But this particular example just asks students to memorize five stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, uh, uh, um, maintenance and relapse. So um, it's just those five stages and that's, they can just memorize it without really understanding it. Instead, you could say something like, or have an objective like, select and describe a motivational intervention based on a patient's level of readiness to change. So here, um, they have to talk about a specific intervention, but then they have to link it to one of those five stages of change and justify why it is that they picked that particular intervention matched to that stage of change. So we're already moving more into sort of skills and application of the model rather than just uh, memorization. So we want to remember, again, those, those stages of curriculum development. So we've gone through the first three. So the general needs uh, assessment, that's sort of the medical health issue that's out there. Targeted needs uh, of your learners. And, and remember the important strategy of including your learners as part of the development process. Setting goals and objectives. And you want to try to climb as high as you can on that pyramid of, of Bloom's taxonomy. So the mind, the heart, and the mind are both uh, more engaged. Um, so even if you aren't an educator or development, uh, the next stage, and this is the instructional methods or pedagogical methods, I think it's related to everyone. Now, I, I like to tell people to, when I'm, I'm teaching teachers, I um, like to tell them to reflect on what are your go-to strategies. And if you're like me, uh, as I went through graduate school and first started teaching, it was all about PowerPoint. And I think of PowerPoint as kind of a necessary evil and it's an efficient way uh, to deliver information to others, but you can't stop there. So what are your other go-tos? Do you like small group discussions? Do you like making videos? Start at what you know well, and then think about how to elaborate, how to enrich, and how to add in some other multimodal instructional strategies. Okay, so let's talk about instructional techniques and what we know from uh, evidence-based teaching. So a lot of continuing education offerings are done in uh, large lecture didactic formats, PowerPoints, much like this one. Um, but we know that uh, PowerPoints aren't necessarily the best way to engage people. So you want to, again, fold in stories. You want to fold in pop quizzes. You want to fold in videos. You want to uh, pause and have people reflect. And if it's a synchronous session uh, where everyone's watching it live, maybe have them go into breakout rooms where they can do pair share or they can discuss or they can do role plays, then come back to the larger group where they can talk about what it is that they've experienced. So let's do our first pop quiz then. So I want you to think uh, about the traditional, what the traditional lecture format does well and what it doesn't do well. Remember, we always want to think about both sides of the coin. So what are the positives and what are the negatives of this traditional lecture PowerPoint format? Okay, think about that. There are pros and cons. 
The second question, what instructional techniques do you think work best? You might draw on your own experience. You might draw on the educational literature. You might draw on other webinars that you, you've heard or feedback you've gotten from learners. What instructional techniques do you think work best? So let's pop up uh, to the top. So what, what works well in traditional lecture format? So it is uh, an efficient way to compress a lot of information, deliver it to a large audience. It takes uh, this sort of a vessel approach where you're filling, the teacher's filling the vessel with knowledge, which we know is somewhat passive. So what it doesn't do well is a PowerPoint uh, lecture, a traditional lecture format. Uh, doesn't always engage uh, the learner. And we've talked a little bit about strategies of how to improve that. So what instructional techniques do you think work best? Okay, well, um, it all depends on what your learning outcomes are. So remember, uh, you might be trying to change uh, hearts. You might be trying to change minds, skills, behaviors, systems, environments. Uh, depends on what it is that you're trying uh, to do. Um, so for something like uh, if you want to teach your learners how to do substance use uh, screening or how to do counseling uh, for substance use disorders, the most effective interventions are, are usually multimodal. So you want to compress or limit didactics as much as you can. And I know that's especially hard when there's so much training that's, that's done online these days. Um, you want to fold in opportunities for discussion, and that's where, you know, learning how to uh, master the Zoom breakout rooms or whatever platform that you're using of how to break people into small groups, bring them back, break them back out. Really important to some, invest some time on how to do that. Uh, doing demonstrations. So uh, an example would be, uh, so one of the courses that I used to teach was uh, group psychotherapy, and it was for, we had a depression one and we had one for uh, depression and comorbid substance use disorders. We talked about the theory, we talked about the skills, but then we actually created a brand new small group that the learners sat in and they watched us uh, run the group. They were sort of a junior co-facilitator. So it wasn't just a classroom demonstration. They were a participant and they were sort of a junior therapist learning how to do uh, that as we went along. You can include uh, videos. And again, this could be videos that you've created or ones that you've uh, found online. There's, as you know, millions of videos that are out there. Uh, the challenge there is sort of weeding through and finding something that's uh, useful for your purposes. We will have a resource list uh, towards uh, the end of the slide set. And then, of course, you want some hands-on practice um, if you're uh, able to do that, depending on your, your setting. So how can you uh, refresh uh, didactics? Now, we've mentioned um, some of these. Uh, some strategies would be to weave in stories and narratives using characters uh, that are similar to your audience. And just to give you an idea of that, I've, I've done a few uh, online CBT courses, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, courses, where uh, at the beginning we introduce uh, three or four different characters, so uh, uh, actors who are playing patients that are uh, the sort of pre-written scripts. Um, they meet each of those characters, and they're uh, selected for uh, diversity of backgrounds, ages, uh, cultures, different problems that they're addressing. And throughout the next 24 lectures for that course, we bring those individuals back to demonstrate how you would do some of those therapeutic techniques that we talk about. But it's the same story of the same character that the, the learner can watch transform uh, over, over a period of time. You want to integrate videos that illustrate a teaching point. Sometimes just sort of changing formats can wake people up a little bit, um, including a fishbowl role play. So when we teach uh, motivational interviewing, we share the research, we share some stories, but then we do a demonstration in front of the class. Uh, or these days we sh show a video because everyone's at home on Zoom, uh, but we want to show them first. Uh, we want to teach them what it is so they know it, then we want to show it, and then actually have them do it afterwards. So that's the see one, do one, teach one idea. Um, folding in uh, ver verbal pop quizzes, just again to get people to start anchoring and thinking of information and where they're starting with their current levels of knowledge and experience. This next one is about stories, 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 and, and I, I would guess that um, all of you have a rich library of stories. Um, sometimes uh, it's hard to think of just the right story, uh, but I would encourage you to uh, create, and I, I actually have a, 
um, a couple of Word documents. And when I, I think of a story or have a particular uh, poignant experience that happens, I go to that file and I actually write in, sort of jot down some notes for that story. So when I'm thinking of talks later, I can go back to that. I, I called it, um, uh, it's called memorable stories. <laughs> and I go to my memorable stories file uh, and I, 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 I zip through it and think about which of those stories uh, would be most helpful. So when you're telling stories, um, you want to evoke as many different sensory uh, details as possible. So what did you see? What did you feel? What did you hear? And the, the, the richer and more nuanced a picture you can paint, the more likely you are to draw people in uh, to that experience. Now, learners hopefully can relate to the main character, even if it's a different uh, uh, sex, a different age, a different cultural background, um, but you want to sort of show the humanity of the self-doubts, of the worries, of the family stressors, of the economic stressors uh, that individual might be going through that your learners could also um, relate to. Um, and the last one, um, cliffhangers or chapter stories. Um, and I know some people love these and some people hate them, uh, but when we have had uh, a series of multiple lectures We'll sometimes give like a, a teaser or a preview of the next session, uh, or we'll pose a particular problem that we know folks are interested in, and then we end the lecture. And the reason we do that is we want them to come back for the next one or come back for the next one so that, again, they can so follow that same narrative uh, thread and feel motivated and engaged to come back. I want to talk a little bit about flipping the classroom, and here I, I think more about how do you expand the reach uh, of your curriculum. So maybe you just have one session. So you're doing a one hour class or a two hour session. Um, how can you fit in all that you want people to learn? Flipping the classroom means that you move the sort of basic foundational reading knowledge didactics. You move that ahead of the class. So people are expected to come prepared uh, and to learn, which doesn't always happen, but they're, they're supposed to come uh, prepared with the basic foundational knowledge, and then the in-person time that you have with them is the application of knowledge. So it's higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. They have the knowledge already. They know the facts. Uh, they can describe it. Now they're going to see it, and maybe they're going to practice doing it while they're in class. Now, a lot of times I get the question, well, people tend not to do their homework, or, or they're too busy, or they come unprepared. So you want to set a period of time in the beginning where there can be near peer teaching. There's almost always some students that do come prepared, so have them work with the students who are less prepared to try to raise everyone up so that they can all meaningfully participate. So what techniques should you use? So ask yourself these questions first. Um, so what are the, the desired learning uh, goals or outcomes? Uh, what levels are your learners? What level of sophistication and experience uh, do they bring? Um, what resources do you have at your disposal and how much time? Now, in uh, some settings, we've had lots of resources, so we were able to uh, create uh, clinical simulations using actors in uh, a studio that uh, looked like an exam room where you would do sort of a, a medical exam and a medical interview and a diagnosis. There were video cameras, there were expert observers. That was sort of the, the Cadillac version uh, of a curriculum. Doesn't happen often, but when you do have those resources, you can really get uh, pretty creative. Um, if not, again, going online, going to those digital libraries, um, and, and trying to stretch out uh, as much time as you have, putting things ahead of the class, but also maybe following up with the class after the session has ended to circle back uh, and see, you know, did they complete their homework? Did they complete their essay? Were they able to go out and practice the conversations or do the reflection exercises? And can you still give them feedback even after the session has ended? Now, there's a, a lot of information on this, but I, I think this gives you a nice, list uh, of thinking about different types of strategies depending on where you are on Bloom's taxonomy. So at the bottom left-hand side, you see knowledge. That's the bottom of the pyramid. And that's uh, the blue on top of that are some samples of teaching methods. So lectures, visuals, videos, audios, um, those are all good ways to impart knowledge. If you're climbing up uh, the pyramid to comprehension, to application, uh, if we look at analysis, for example, so here we want problem sets, exercises, using case studies, talking about critical incidents that have happened and trying to understand what they happened and what we might do to solve uh, those problems. 
case discussions, uh, questions, or, or even uh, exams. So when you're thinking about your curriculum, think about the level of objective that you want to teach, and then you can look at this particular figure and you can see what sorts of interventions in blue on top uh, might be helpful in achieving that level of objective. This is just a, a different way, I think a more simplified way to, to think about it. So if you look at your class me methods on the left-hand side, is it mass instruction, is it individualized learning, or is it small group learning? Um, and we actually do in our health professional training sort of all three of those. The middle column tells you the role of the, the teacher. Uh, with individualized le learning there in the middle, you can see that uh, it's our job to curate information uh, to uh, essentially uh, trigger learning and send resources to the individual, depending on where the individual student is. On the bottom row, the group learning. So we do a lot of work with our small group facilitators and they learn to facilitate discussion so that the learning happens through the group and not just in the group. So we don't want them to be giving many lectures during a small group discussion. We want them to have the skills of pulling out and facilitating conversation between the learners in that group so that the learners are talking a lot more than the facilitator does. This is a, a, another way to, to think about some of the different types of, of learning, and I know we haven't talked much about that, uh, but audio learning, visual learning, and kinesthetic learning. And again, sort of the, on this one, the, the deeper you go, I think the more active it feels. So for kinesthetic learning, it, it would be actually going onto the wards or going into clinic and actually performing the skills with your hands and your eyes and your ears. So it's not just the knowledge, it's not just the heart, but it's also the, the hands uh, that you're using. Visual learning, so here you know, are, are videos, watching a demonstration, that sort of fishbowl role play that we've talked about. Audio learning is the, the most passive, which doesn't mean it's bad, but it's harder to keep people engaged. Um, these days there are thousands and thousands of, say, podcasts that are out there. But if you notice in a really good podcast, it is all audio learning, but they tell lots of stories. There's music. They're pulling in sensory details. Uh, they're using emotional tones. Uh, they're really sort of activating sort of your own emotional experience, even though the stimulus is just auditory. Okay. So where are we now? So we've been through four of the seven uh, stages. Uh, and we just talked about instructional methods. So let's talk about uh, implementation uh, stages next and refers to change management strategies. So how are you going to sell it? Uh, how are you going to make sure that you have the support necessary to uh, run the particular program? The sixth stage is evaluation, and the seventh stage is that sort of stages of iterative improvement. So let's talk a, a little bit about assessment, because I think that's a, um, a particularly challenging one. And unfortunately, it's one that often falls off the map until after the course has happened, or maybe you're halfway through the course and you think, oh, I have to write the exam still, or I still have to do uh, this sort of assessment and, and uh, learn uh, whether or not my uh, learners are where they're supposed to be. Remember, there's two things at least that you can assess. You can assess your learners, have they picked up what you wanted them to pick up, um, but you can also assess the overall quality of the curriculum and maybe the impact that your curriculum has had. So there's a couple of models that I'll, I'll show. I'll just show Miller's pyramid quickly and then uh, move on to some of the Kirkpatrick levels uh, of evaluation. So Miller's pyramid is a skills acquisition model. So it gives you an idea of the stages that a learner goes through when they're trying to learn a skill. And I'll just show you this uh, pyramid. So here at the bottom pyramid, this is sort of just the informational level. A learner knows uh, how to do a physical exam, or a learner knows what a physical exam is in the steps. And then the next level is they know how to do it, so they know sort of the, the sequence of how to do it. The level above that is they can actually show it. So here's the kinesthetic part where they're demonstrating a skill, uh, and they can show you probably in a slower time or maybe in a role play that they can do it. And then the top level of the pyramid is they actually do it. So if you're really wanting to integrate those skills, maybe it's substance use screening, maybe it's doing cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching them what it is, teaching them sort of how the steps that you would go through, letting them do some supervised uh, role play practice, and then actually uh, having them work with patients uh, under your supervision sort of brings them to the top level of that pyramid. 
A Kirkpatrick level helps us to think more about the impact that our program has had. And it can be a program, it could be a session. So we want to think about, again, sort of starting at the bottom and, and moving up. Um, it's not usually framed as a pyramid, but you could, could think, it, uh, think about it that way, too. So level one is, is at the bottom, and that's uh, most commonly used. Um, this is the learner's reaction to the curriculum. So when you have a continuing education session and they say on a scale of one to five, how satisfied are you with the teaching that you just experienced? That is an assessment of your reaction. Satisfaction and reaction is important because you know, then have an idea of the experience of the learner. Um, however, I would encourage you not to stop at reactions. A lot of times folks do stop at that reaction level because it's quick and it's, it's easy and you don't want to overburn uh, learners. I don't want to overburden learners. The next level up is learning. So you might uh, have an exam. You might uh, have them demonstrate what they've learned and then grade uh, their ability to deliver the skills that you have taught them. So it's not just do they like the curriculum. Did they change? Did your learners uh, change? The next level up is behavior. So after taking your webinar, did your learner go to clinic and effectively use the substance use screeners that you just taught them? In their clinical practice, are they now uh, prescribing uh, naloxone or providing naloxone to anyone that has, uh, uh, has been on chronic opioids? So you want to see if there's been a change, a meaningful change in their behavior. And then the, the level four, which is the hardest level to get to, um, has your organization changed as a consequence of training? Has the climate changed, the culture changed, uh, the billing practices, the documentation practices, um, the number of people getting x waivered to prescribe buprenorphine? Can you show that there are concrete changes uh, in your organization? Okay. Here are some examples of different evaluation tools, tests of attitudes, surveys, interviews, uh, peer reports. Uh, tests of knowledge, you know, multiple choice uh, are uh, popular. They're hard to write quality multiple choice questions. OEQs are open-ended questions similar to uh, short answers. So you'll have maybe a case vignette and then uh, the learner will write a paragraph or so in, in answer. There may be applied case exercises, oral exams. To test skills and competence, maybe direct observations, simulations, or maybe real world observations. Um, you might also indirectly look at chart reviews and chart notes uh, that your learners have uh, written. And you might also go to patients and uh, peers to get feedback on how uh, uh, competently your learners have been. So again, if you do a little bit of self-reflection, I want you to think about your role as learners and what evaluation tools you currently use when you teach, whether you think those are valid and reliable, if there are ways to update those, maybe ways to change those, try something different. Another thing to reflect about is when you were a learner, how were you evaluated? Was it fair? Was it comprehensive? Did it really tap into what you had learned? And if not, how could it have been improved? Some of the considerations, uh, what's your intended uh, learning outcome? So where are you on that Kirkpatrick level? How much will it cost? How much time will it take? And of course, you want to look at our models that we've used to help sort of guide the choices uh, that you make. OK. All right, so we've been through uh, some of the basic principles of evidence-based teaching, of thinking about adult learners, of appreciating the developmental stages of our learners, the different types of learning settings or learning sessions that we might create. We've walked through a couple of models on how to uh, create curriculum, uh, and then we've looked at different educational strategies, and there's a long list of different types of things that you can try out and maybe using already. And then we've talked a bit uh, about uh, evaluation. Now, it does take a lot of upfront work, but I promise you that it's absolutely worth the investment. I know time is, is always precious and we never have enough of it, uh, but it can actually save you time in the end if you've invested the time upfront and have your evaluation strategies in place, um, your learning strategies uh, selected, and especially have your stakeholders on board already to help you through this process. Um, these are just the, the references that you can review later if you're interested. And here are some of the resources for evidence-based teaching. 
Um, all of these uh, resources have uh, important digital libraries. Some of them have videos. Uh, some of them have uh, PowerPoint talks. Uh, really up to you just to start working your way through their library. I think in particular, if you go to AAMC, that's the Association of American Medical Colleges, they have a portal called Medical Education Portal. It's for mostly uh, medical schools and nursing schools, but also some pharmacy schools and dental schools have been using that. There's a lot, a lot of peer-reviewed educational materials that you can download and you can use, uh, as well as uh, the National League for Nurses and PCSS has a lot specific to substance use disorders. So let me pause there, and it looks like we have just a few minutes left. Um, so, Carrie, if there's time for any Q&A or if I'm able to answer any questions, I'd be happy to do that. Great. Well, that was excellent. I know I got a lot out of it, and I'm sure that our participants did as well, so we're glad you used your time. And um, I would just encourage if people want to either put a question in the chat box or I've been trying to keep everyone muted, so if you want to unmute yourself, um, or use the raise the hand function and let us know a question that you have. We can spend a couple minutes doing that. I know for me, I was really interested in the piece about like assessing need because that's something that I always find challenging is, um, you know, do you do a pretest? Do you, like you said, you can ask, you know, but it just, it's just difficult, I feel like, to get a holistic assessment of what students actually need and where to start. And then sometimes people are at different levels. Um, like I teach introductory uh, gen ed sometimes, and it can be really hard to know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any, like, kind of main focus points or what you could what I could focus on or teachers could focus on? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And what we tend to do is a pretest. And the pretest has uh, two elements. There is a, usually an attitude survey that's in there. So, um, for instance, it would be, you know, a, um, and we, we just taught a, a, a class on uh, housing insecurity and homelessness. And we wanted to first assess the participants' beliefs on what they think caused homelessness. And so we took what were like the top five myths, you know, people don't want housing. Um, if they would just take their medications for their mental illness, they wouldn't be on the street. And so we, we went through all the, those myths, but we didn't, we didn't say they were myths. We just had them rate on a Likert scale, their level of agreement with those myths. So we had an idea of the kinds of attitudes and beliefs that the class was coming in with. Mm -hmm. In the pretest, we often have sort of knowledge. So we will, um, it can be multiple choice, or we will also say have a case vignette of a patient that has certain symptoms that may be representative of a substance use disorder. And we will say, what diagnosis does this person have? What type of treatment would be indicated? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we've been surprised. The students nail it, and we're like, okay, they know this stuff. We can move yeah. past, you know, the introductory level. But other times, um, you know, they, they don't. So we're like, okay, we'll start with the 101 basic stuff, you know, and we'll teach them that way. Um, the other way is to talk to the learners, you know, to um, uh, invite, and we've done this before, we, you know, invite learners to have a focus group saying, hey, next year we're thinking about some new coursework. If anyone's interested in having some input, uh, you know, join this focus group. And they'll come into the focus group, and I, you know, always, you know, keep in mind that it's probably a self-selected sample, and maybe they're not sure. representative of the whole group, yeah. but it does at least give you an idea of, you know, this is what we want, this is what uh, we need. And our example of teaching about uh, race, uh, anti-racism, uh, health uh, equities or inequities, it really has changed. And it's changed because the learners come in in a very different place than they used to, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. So a couple of comments in the chat. I see, um, thank you for wonderful presentation. Um, I, there's a question of what is PCSS? And that's where we found you. That's how we found out about you. <laughs> Sorry. So PCSS is Prescribers Clinical Support System, and uh, it was funded by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, uh, and it is a consortium of 
I've lost count, but probably at least a dozen different professional organizations in the realm of substance use. And they have a lot of curriculum for uh, health professionals that work in the field of addiction medicine. So it's about screening, diagnosis, prevention. Um, they first started with um, how do you treat opioid use disorders, and, and, and since then they've gotten uh, you know, a lot broader than that. They provide um, coursework, but also mentorship. So if someone is interested in being a buprenorphine prescriber, for instance, and working with patients with opioid use disorder, but they're kind of on their own out in a federally qualified health center and they don't feel like they have enough support, they can connect through PCSS with a mentor and get sort of regular supervision and updates for free through that site. Um, they do have a 22 lecture introductory substance use course that's free um, and you can download the materials and that's online too. That's great. Well, we're going to finish with one last question. Um, can you speak to using rubrics? Um, not sure about what's meant by rubrics. So when the first place my mind goes, so when we use um, all of our exams in the med school have moved away from multiple choice and are now open to new questions, and we create scoring rubrics for the open to new questions. And um, the reason we create, create a rubric, even though it can be sort of painful, to, <laughs> it's not my favorite thing in the world to, to do, yeah. um, it allows the graders to uh, consistently review and grade the students' answers in the same way. So if there's a maximum of six points, you know exactly what it takes from the rubric, what will get you six points, what are the six different things, you know, or five points, four points, three points, and so on. But it, it provides a structure so that there's a consistency and a fairness to, to grading, regardless of who happens to be doing the grading. So I, I think they're a little painful to create, but probably really yeah. useful, especially in a large class. Well, as, as this um, question was coming from one of my, my personal teachers, I know that she, she's, uh, she has taught us to, to create rubrics as painful as they can be for yeah. the, those reasons you discussed. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I know that you are very busy and we have taken your time and we're so grateful. And I know everyone else has other obligations, so we're going to wrap it up. But thank you so much. I think it was incredibly interesting and we already got requests for you in the chat to come back and teach on similar topics. So um, we appreciate that. And is there anything else you want to say before we? I, I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. I, I love teaching about teaching and I think despite all the stresses, you know, these days that uh, teaching and sort of reaching into the hearts and minds of, of our learners is just really an important privilege and always try to hold on to that. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you so much. And we will end with uh, goodbye to all wherever you are around the world and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>